It's a great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Jennifer Lai. Um, Dr. Lai has been recognized nationally, internationally, for her uh, groundbreaking work on frailty in liver disease and really opened up a new field um, <clears throat> for liver disease and really has a uh, very strong impact on liver transplant. And Dr. Lai has been done extremely well, receiving multiple awards for research and uh, recently secured an R01 grant f uh, funding from NIH. So uh, I also recognize that she changed the title of her talk, uh, but it's very similar. Uh, it's integrating frailty into clinical practice and also nutrition in liver disease before transplant. Uh, Jen. Thank you very much, Francis. It's always an honor to be here uh, to speak to you. And feel free to interrupt me during the conversation. You can just wave your hand. I'm happy to answer any questions along the way. Um, I did change the talk to frailty because I think it's integral to nutrition. Um, but don't worry, I'll cover nutritional interventions uh, later. Um, my financial disclosures include the fact that I'm a consultant for Excello Health, which is making a nutritional supplement. But I will not be discussing their product here today. So I want you to think back to the patient that Courtney just presented. Remember, she was a 50-something-year-old woman, well-compensated cirrhosis, um, who uh, was acutely hospitalized with uh, SBP. And I want to just add one more piece of information to her story. And that is her physiologic reserve. Now, just think. She was 50. She was well-compensated. Maybe she was working. And I would say that she had pretty high physiologic reserve. That's just the, pic the patient that I was picturing when Courtney was telling us the story. Um, but then she experienced this acute stressor of the SBP. And of course, anybody who's acutely hospitalized with this acute stressor is going to experience some episode of a decrease, sort of a rapid depletion of their physiologic reserve. But then in the end, this woman did OK. She got antibiotics. We had enough time because she had enough physiologic reserve for us to actually get control of this infection, get control of any HRS that was going to happen. And in fact, she got discharged, and she's waiting on the wait list. And you know, now her MELT score is 25, so you can see sort of her physiologic reserve is not the same as it was before, but she's doing OK. I think she's going to make it to transplant. But what if that piece of information that I gave you instead is that she has low physiologic reserve, and she experiences exactly the same acute stressor of SBP, and we propel her into that area, that zone of adverse outcomes, where all of a sudden SBP, and then we give her some ceftriaxone, and then she develops C. diff. And then she's in the hospital for more days, and then she's immobile, and then she gets a DVT, and then we can't anticoagulate her appropriately because she's so decompensated and is at high bleeding risk. Or we do anticoagulate her, and then she bleeds from a varix. She gets intubated for her EGD. She develops ventilator-associated pneumonia, on and on and on. That's what happens when people have low physiologic reserve or, in other words, are frail. So frailty is so integral to this idea of improving um, you know, the health of patients with cirrhosis and their nutritional status because it really is the state of decreased physiologic reserve as well as increased vulnerability to health stressors. And that is really going to be the foundation for this talk. And so that's why I changed the title to Integrating Frailty into Clinical Practice. And I want to offer you three concrete steps to integrating frailty in our clinical practice. The first is to understand the impact of frailty on the patients that we're managing together. The second is to, to learn uh, one tool on how to assess frailty in your clinical practice. And the third is going to be the meat of the, of the talk on implementing strategies. So let's start with understanding the impact. There are a number of reasons why our patients with cirrhosis develop physical frailty. Of course, you know them all. Encephalopathy, they don't want to eat. It changes their taste buds. They're in a hypermetabolic state, so they're sort of needing a lot more calories. But they can't take in so many calories because they have a cycle 
ascites and it's compressing upon their stomach. Uh, they're not making as much protein, so they're, they're losing muscle mass and they're losing the nutritional status at an accelerated rate. The ascites is affecting their absorption. This leads to this chronic state of undernutrition and reduction in physical activity, which leads to the physical manifestation of sarcopenia, and then what you see in clinical practice, which is physical frailty, all of which, of course, makes all of these factors worse. So it is just a vicious cycle. And when we start using objective instruments of physical frailty and, and overall frailty uh, in this population of, of cirrhosis, um, we, we begin to learn that our patients with cirrhosis, although their median age is 57, that's the median age of patients on the UCSF transplant list and actually the national transplant list, we actually begin to understand their true, chrono uh, their true physiologic age beyond their chronologic age. So 20% are actually frail by a very classic geriatric instrument called the Freed Frailty Index. 40% are functionally impaired by the short physical performance battery. At least 30% have difficulty with at least one age activity of daily living. These are, these are activities that are necessary for basic functioning within one's home. And 30% have difficulty with that one, at least one of these. And these rates of physical frailty and functional impairment and disability are actually equivalent to 85-year-old community-dwelling adults, if you look into the geriatric literature to compare. So this patient that Courtney just mentioned, if you add the, you know, the 54-year-old woman, all of a sudden, if she has frailty and low physiologic reserve, it is like managing an 85-year-old in the hospital. And you can imagine why it's so difficult to manage our patients with cirrhosis. Frailty is a strongly predictive of weightless mortality in our patients, regardless of MELD score. And I'm going to show you a little bit more data a little later on uh, um, that, will, that will further enhance this message. But you can see here the rates of weightless mortality by patients who are in the low MELD category and those, oh, you can't see my pointer. Oh, here it is. Um, so patients who are in the low meld category on the left and patients who are, are higher meld on the right. Oh, someone's, thank you. Can you see? Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then the higher meld patients on the right, and you can see how rates of weightless mortality not only go up between frail and non-frail patients, but I think even more interestingly is that the rates of weightless mortality are the same regardless of their meld score. Um, so think about this. We are we we are trained as patients who take care of, or as physicians who or providers who take care of patients with cirrhosis to be obsessed with MELD score for prognostication. But it turns out that it's actually frailty. That's the great discriminator, at least among patients on the wait list. One of the other factors that one of the major contributors to frailty is sarcopenia. And one of the most important things about sarcopenia is that it actually has been shown to predict outcomes after liver transplant, which is particularly relevant to this uh, conference. And you can see here that total psoas area, which is a metric of, of muscle mass, uh, actually is strongly predictive of, of mortality after transplant. So as muscle mass decreases, as they become more sarcopenic and ultimately more frail, the risk of mortality after liver transplant increases. So sarcopenia is um, rapidly emerging as a really important marker along with frailty uh, in the cirrhosis uh, setting, hepatology and liver transplant settings. So that's the general impact of frailty on our patients. But how do we assess it? So at UCSF, we have a study called the Frailty Study. It stands for Functional Assessment in Liver Transplantation Study. And in 500 of our patients, these are the patients that we are co-managing together, um, in over 500 of them, we developed a liver frailty index. This is an index to measure frailty, so to capture the, the um, constellation of malnutrition and functional impairment and muscle wasting in our patients um, using three performance-based tests that can be uh, performed in the clinic setting in, on average, 89.7 seconds by our medical assistants. And it consists of three tests, the grip strength using a hand dynamometer, 
the chair stand, so you ask a patient to stand up and sit down five times without using their hands, and you just time them on your on your smartphone. And then balance testing, uh, you have them ba you ask them to balance ten seconds in three different positions that are sort of in escalating difficulty, uh, and and then you can just actually go to our calculator online, the Liver Frailty Index. UCSF.edu and uh, just calculate their score. And we have uh, determined that a liver frailty index of greater than or equal to 4.5 is uh, defined as frail. And frailty, importantly, is a great discriminator for weightless mortality and predictor. So here are predicted probabilities of survival of weightless mortality by both MELD score and frailty. So you can see here that a patient, here's a patient with a MELD score of 14 who is robust, has the highest predicted probability of survival. Now go to the other solid line down here, this aqua line, and um, that's also solid. This patient has the same MELD score, okay? But this patient is frail. And look how the predicted probability of survival, how different that is. Now, Look at the dotted lines now. This is this dotted line up here is a patient with a MELD of 23 who's robust. And then look at the, the equivalent MELD 23 who's frail. Now, in clinic, I would I, I used to look at a patient with a MELD of 14 and I would say, I don't know when you're gonna get a transplant. I don't know if you need a transplant. You know, we'll just we'll just wait and see. And a patient with a MELD of 23, I would say, get ready for transplant, you're gonna need it, you're gonna get sick, you're gonna decompensate. There's no there's no question in my mind that you're gonna go to transplant and probably in the next year. But we're what we're seeing here is that frailty predicts is actually nine meld points of risk. And this meld of 14 who is frail needs to be treated um, and needs to prepare his or her life situation as if they are going to die or are, are highly at risk of death. What I love about uh, having an objective metric of frailty and really malnutrition in these patients is that you can actually provide this information to patients um, and motivate them. So here is actually the histogram of the liver frailty indices or scores among our 538 patients in the cohort, original cohort. Um, and, you, and, and I actually provide this information to my patients because my frail patients, what do they say when I tell them they're frail? They say it's because I'm sick. It's because I have liver disease, doctor. Of course I'm, I can't move around. And then I tell them, well, actually, among patients on the wait list, you're in this category. I lost my pointer. Um, you're actually in, oops, sorry. You're actually in this 90th percentile. You are, uh, you are weaker than 90% of the patients on the cohort. And then I can provide them with some targets. And I can say, today, you are weaker than 90% of, of the patients, but I want you to implement some strategies so that we can get you closer to the median. Um, even with your same liver disease score, which you can't change. You can't change your MELD score. There's nothing you can do. But you can empower them with information and motivation to try to get better in ways that are really important. Now, this is a study that we recently, we just presented it at the liver meeting uh, last week, and we, we also looked at how frailty can predict weightless mortality in the presence of ascites and hepatic encephalopathy. We've previously shown that it, it really predicts mortality independent of MELD score, but I really wanted to see, well, is it as important as ascites and encephalopathy, which we all know are strong predictors of death, right? It is the reason why we refer a patient to transplant is because they have ascites. They have encephalopathy, therefore they are at risk of death. <clears throat> so here are the rates of weightless mortality among patients without ascites. And you can see that the patient who's frail, the dark black bar, is signif at significantly higher risk of death or has, has significantly higher rates of death um, ca uh, calculated by the Kaplan-Meier curve, so adjusted for follow-up time um, at 12 months. Uh, and so it's over double the rate of weightless mortality than a patient without ascites. Now look at a patient, patients with ascites. Again, patients who are frail with ascites have over double the rate of weightless mortality as somebody who is not frail, even if they have ascites. Now look at the gray bars though. 10, 16%, they're practically the same. So again, ascites is not actually the strongest predictor of death in this cohort. 
we see the same pattern with encephalopathy. Again, double the rates of death in those who are frail and not frail among those without encephalopathy, but those with encephalopathy, again, double the rates of weightless mortality. And again, if you look at the gray bars, the non-frail patients, hepatic encephalopathy doesn't make a huge difference on their mortality. So going back to this idea that we've all been trained to look at these traditional, risk, these traditional prog prognostic indicators of death, MELD score, ascites, hepatic encephalopathy, all of those classic portal hypertensive complications. But in the end, when it comes to a patient who is listed for transplant, it ends up being frailty that matters. I am so delighted to tell you that we have finally succeeded in integrating the um, objective measurement of frailty using the liver frailty index into our UCSF liver transplant clinics. Every patient who comes in for evaluation and also longitudinally is getting a measurement of frailty um, in clinic, it, it, through our medical assistance. It's being input into our EPIC uh, electronic health record. Just for your information, if you're interested in doing this too, we have made this electronic health record, uh, or sorry, we've made this EPIC flow sheet available for you to integrate through the community uh, web library. And um, also there's a smart phrase that pulls in the liver frailty indices, not just that, that during that visit, but also longitudinally. So it's, it's available for use, and you can email me if you're interested. My, my coordinators are very used to helping other centers set this up at yours. So the last, and perhaps the most important, is to implement strategies. But I went through this whole sort of talk about the measurement of frailty, because you can't really implement strategies until you know how your patient is doing, and until you have a metric that allows you to follow how much they're improving or not improving to your, your uh, strategy. So, the European Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition has some very specific nutritional goals in liver disease, and that is a recommended energy intake of 35 to 40 kilocalories per kilogram of body weight per day, and 1.2 to 1.5 grams of protein per kilogram body weight per day. Now let me just do the math for you. So just take the average one, 60 kilogram individual, 132 pounds, that actually translates into up to 2,400 calories per day and up to 90 grams of protein per day. Let's take a person who is 95 kilograms, so 209 pounds. We're talking about 38,000 calories a day or even you know well over 100 grams of protein. It is so important to do this calculation for your patients because your patients, you know, your frail patients, you're saying, are you eating? And they say, I do, I eat, doctor, I really do. But they're not eating 3,800 calories a day, I promise you. I can't even eat 3,800 calories a day. That's really hard to do. And it's really hard to eat 100 grams of protein per day. You know, they say, oh, I had an egg for breakfast, but you know what, an egg is six grams of protein. So it's really important for you to give them these specific metrics. Uh, some experts in the field have recommended BMI modified um, uh, cut, uh, cutoffs for calories and, and uh, actually for calories. Um, and this is important in our age of, you know, we have competing interests. The obesity researchers want their patients to lose weight. I want them to gain weight. We want them to gain muscle mass, and that is through protein intake. So they have to reduce their calories, but they have to up their, their percentage protein. It is very critical that protein not be restricted in these patients with cirrhosis even in those patients who are coming into the hospital with hepatic encephalopathy. This is false, false, false information. They should not be restricting their protein. And number one reason is because we have medicines to treat hepatic encephalopathy, okay? We have uh, lactulose, and thanks to Dr. Bass, we have rifaximin as well. We have zinc, we have probiotics. We can manage their encephalopathy. If they get frail, they are going to die. Okay, but there is actually a randomized clinical trial that has uh, demonstrated this fact as, at, um, as well. So this was a study of 30 patients with cirrhosis presenting to the emergency room with hepatic encephalopathy, randomized to 14 days of a low protein diet versus a normal protein diet, normal being 1.2 grams per kilogram per body weight per day, and there was no difference in the evolution of hepatic encephalopathy in these patients hospitalized for hepatic encephalopathy during their hospitalization, but most importantly, in this group that received the low protein diet, they had increased early protein breakdown. Um, so 
the, it, the study did not look at you know frailty, didn't look at long-term outcomes, but we know how important um, muscle mass and physical function are to outcomes. So you can imagine if you restrict protein in these patients and they're losing their total body protein, you can imagine that's going to really infect, affect their outcomes. Now, does the type of protein matter? There's certainly a lot of buzz about branched-chain amino acids, and there has, in 2015, there was a Cochrane uh, systematic, database systematic review on branched-chain amino acids. There have actually been a lot of studies um, looking, uh, randomizing patients to BCAAs versus no BCAAs, um, either IV or oral, and they've included a total of 108, sorry, 860 patients with cirrhosis. There was, in fact, an overall benefit of branched-chain amino acids on the outcome of hepatic encephalopathy, but it was compared to a control group of patients who were not on any HE meds. A lot of these studies, think about it, this study came out in 2015. A lot of these randomized clinical trials were back in the early 2000s when we were still using neomycin, which of course we don't even use, and um, before really every patient with cirrhosis was practically was on lactulose and before rifaximin really became available. So if they looked, if they actually looked at the, restricted the, um, the systematic review to those patients who were um, on lactulose or neomycin as the control, there was actually no benefit or harm of BCAAs on the outcome of hepatic encephalopathy. No study has yet compared this to rifaximin or the control of rifaximin, and importantly, no effect of BCAAs on mortality, quality of life or nutritional parameters. So in clinical practice, I actually don't um, focus on BCAAs. I think our patients have a hard enough time eating enough protein. However, I'll show you that they will get their BCAAs if they meet their protein targets. So in practice, I wanna just be practical for you. If you do wanna use BCAAs, if you have a patient that's you know one of those people who takes notes and really, really has the personality that clings on to um, instructions, um, you, can, you can tell them, well, if you wanna eat BCAAs, try to get 12 to 14 grams of them per day. And here is sort of an example of some of the high protein foods. So um, chicken, salmon, eggs, peanuts, they have a lot of protein, you can see in that, in that um, right uh, column, and they actually, if you're eating protein, you're, you are getting branched-chain amino acids. They are naturally occurring amino acids. What I like to do is I like to make it a little bit easy because, you know, our patients aren't really calculating their ounces of, of chicken or salmon, and so I use this palm guide uh, to serving size. So I tell them about a palm of chicken is one serving, and that's probably about 30 grams of protein per day. A palm of fish is probably about 30 grams of protein per day, um, and serving sizes of peanut butter about a tablespoon, just to give them a, a sort of a ballpark um, of, of, how, of um, how much protein they're taking in. And if they, take in, if they meet their protein needs, they will definitely meet BCAA targets. And then consider supplementation with um, over-the-counter supplements um, or protein powders if they are unable to meet these targets. The next most important intervention other than recommending, recommending high protein diets is uh, the late evening snack, is the timing of protein. This is, or the timing of any food and caloric intake. This is so critical. The patients are actually wasting away at night when they're sleeping. Um, and so, and this is because of course, the, you know, the, the, the cirrhotic liver has decreased gluconeogenesis. So in order for the, the, the body to feed the brain and the heart and the lungs, they need to break down um, the, the protein from the skeletal muscle to, to generate amino acid needs, and then that leads to an overall state of protein energy malnutrition. The metabolic profile of a patient with cirrhosis after an overnight fast is equivalent to the metabolic profile of a healthy person after three days of starvation. Our patients wake up every, with cirrhosis, wake up every morning in a state of starvation. So the whole point of the late evening snack is to give the snack before bedtime to really break that fast, really interrupt the amount of time that they don't have external sources of calories and nutrition. So the optimal composition is, in general, it's about 210 kilocalories um, of a late evening snack. The studies have studied all types of, of late evening snacks, glucose, rice, regular food, supplemental shake, branched chain amino acid enriched supplement. My personal practice is to recommend a cup of Greek yogurt and a table of, tablespoon of chia seeds. 
I know nobody really knows what chia seeds are, but I would go, I encourage you to actually go on Amazon right now or go to Trader Joe's. It's actually at any supermarket. It is truly a superfood. They are actually really delicious, but they're kind of flavor, flavorless, so you can add them to anything, and they are crunchy, and what I love about them is that they don't take up space. So they're, they, they give you texture. They don't give you taste, right, because our patients don't actually want anything. They just don't feel like eating anything, and then they, a lot of times the shake just fills their stomach up and they don't want to eat anything. But these chia seeds are so efficient and they pack in a ton of fat and protein. Check them out, they're so great. Um, the other thing I recommend is a small handful of unsalted walnuts. I think that's a really great option. But they're dry, our patients with cirrhosis don't love them. Try the chia seeds. So um, there, there is really great evidence. I love that this is my absolute favorite study. It was a randomized clinical trial of uh, patients who received uh, a sort of a, a supplement, sh a supplemental shake or supplements, um, either at nighttime or during the day. They had isocaloric diets, but the nocturnal day, the nocturnal supplement group only took their their supplements between 9 p.m. and 7 a.m. And then the daytime group only took them during the same, you know, during the daytime. And you can see, look at the nighttime feeding group, which is on the right in the black bars. You can see their total body protein increased. This was no change in calories. This was only a change in the timing of the food intake. This is so powerful. And I am not this I'm not endorsing any specific product. I am just reporting data from the study. In the study, the supplements were two cans of Ensure Plus or diabetic resource. So they took in 710 calories per day extra just at nighttime. Again, just changing the timing. So this is, this is not like a special formulation they got from a drug company. This is stuff your patients can go to Costco and buy today. Testosterone is, is, I just know in five years we're gonna be using testosterone more routinely. I'm, I, we're just gonna see more studies, but this was one very powerful randomized clinical trial that was published um, by an Australian colleague of mine, uh, Marie Sinclair, in the Journal of Hepatology in 2016. 50 patients randomized to testosterone, 50 patients, sorry, 50 male patients with low testosterone uh, with cirrhosis randomized to in, uh, injections of testosterone versus uh, placebo injections. And you can see this is uh, how the lean mass changed after 12 months of this uh, intervention. The lean mass improved significantly in the testosterone group. The lean mass decreases, declines in those uh, without who got the placebo. And then the fat mass did the reverse. So fat mass, um, uh, uh, they lost fat mass. Um, so they replaced it with the lean body mass in the testosterone group and um, the in the placebo group, it just went up. So I think this is really powerful information. In the study, imp importantly, there was no increased uh, risk, uh, no increased rate of portal vein thrombosis. Uh, there was no increased rate of cancer development. Um, and there was, there was a trend towards improvement or I improvement in survival among the testosterone group. And this group is right now uh, launching a much larger study that is powered to mortality. Um, I think we're gonna be seeing some really important uh, information from these trials in the future. My personal practice practice is to check uh, testosterone levels in my male patients with cirrhosis and refer them to uh, our endocrinology colleagues if low. Okay, so the last component, of course, is exercise. You can't build muscle without also exercising. Um, and exercise is defined as activity requiring physical effort carried out especially to sustain or improve health and fitness. What do your patients tell you they do when you ask them if they exercise? They walk. Not enough. It's just not enough. Walking to get your mail, walking your dog, it's just not enough. We have to be much more specific. Exercise needs to consist of things that build aerobic endurance, resistance, and also improve, and or improve flexibility and balance. There have been, uh, I think it's like six or, I think it's almost eight studies now, very small studies looking at exercise programs, only including about 100 patients with cirrhosis. The vast majority of, the, of, being, of them were child PUA. The duration of these, tri of these exercise programs was up to 16 weeks. Uh, they were almost all center-based exercise, but there was huge improvement in exercise. There's no 
doubt that exercise is important. I think this is an area of growth. This is where a lot of groups, including ours, are really entering into, really trying to improve uh, this aspect, really trying to develop home-based exercise programs, and also programs that are well-suited for the child B and C patients with cirrhosis. Uh, in your clinical practice, it's really important to be specific, and these are the fit recommendations for exercise. You have to tell them the frequency. You have to advise on the intensity. Walking is not enough. You have to tell them how long um, and the type of exercise. Again, the type being a, they have to work on aerobic endurance, resistance, and flexibility and balance, so be specific. There is a great tool. One of my colleagues, Punita Tandon at the University of Alberta, um, has developed this wellness toolbox. She's Canadian, so it's .ca. It's awesome. And there are some, there are some you, can, you can do this like nutrition calculator so they can calculate what their caloric needs are. Um, they, they have videos on specific exercises. It, um, she's actually developing a meditation. She has all these meditation videos. So if the, the patient responds to those sites, uh, you know, complementary and alternative medicine uh, therapies, this is such a beautiful resource uh, for patients with cirrhosis. She is a hepatologist. It was developed for patients with cirrhosis, but probably good for all patients anyways. And lest you fear that your patient is going to pop a varix while they're exercising, do not fear. I will put that fear to rest. Um, in a patient, of, in a study of, of 50 patients with compensated cirrhosis who underwent 16 weeks of supervised exercise, this was done in, in um, Europe where they do a lot more HVPG measurements, HV, HVPG actually decreased. It didn't increase. So uh, these patients, of course, you have to you know, do the regular screening for varices, put them on non-selective beta blocker prophylaxis if indicated, um, but it's okay. You can recommend exercise. So. The three key steps to integrating frailty into clinical practice includes understanding the impact. Frailty is prevalent. Frailty is a critical determinant of outcomes. You can use the objective and performance-based and simple liver frailty index to objectively measure frailty in your clinical practice. And discrete and practical strategies that you can implement uh, with your patients immediately include recommending high-protein diets, late evening snack, and, tar and, and specific recommendations about exercise that include aerobic resistance, that, that enhance aerobic endurance, resistance, and flexibility and balance. I'm just going to end with just a sort of conceptual framework for how to incorporate frailty into clinical practice. On the, on the left side, you'll see these patient components that we're always thinking about when we're assessing our patients, right? Synthetic dysfunction, portal hypertension, cardiac function, their pulmonary status, their kidney status. We also are always subconsciously integrating muscle wasting, undernutrition, and physical inactivity into our decision making, right? We have objective tools for this. We have objective tools we look at, we use, we order all the time to assess cardiac function. We also have objective tools and, and signs that we use in clinical practice to assess the patient's pulmonary status, renal function. But why don't we have anything in clinical practice to measure what's probably the biggest determinant of mortality in this population? I would argue we can implement frailty tools such as the liver frailty index in order to really improve and inform our decision making. Thank you very much. Any questions? Dr. Bolas. When I think of frailty, I always think of older age. And all the Sator reports didn't include age in it intentionally. Mm -hmm. So how much, if any, impact does age just being reflected in your frailty? So what we just uh, presented this at the ASLD as well, and hopefully we'll have that out in publication pretty soon. Um, age, so patients who are older are more frail. They're more likely to be frail. But the interesting thing is that frailty continues to be a determinant of outcomes regardless of how old one, one is. So a 65-year-old who's frail, although they have higher, a 65-year-old has higher rates of frailty than a 45-year-old, regardless of age, frailty is the thing that determines outcomes. So um, I would even flip that and say that a 65, a 68-year-old, a 70-year-old who's robust 
that's the kind of patient that's probably going to make that's probably going to make it to transplant, right? So this is going to frailty is going to be the way. Not just fra you know the frail patient who's older is very vulnerable, but the frail patient who's robust is someone we should probably be pushing for transplant in. So frailty is a predictor independent of age. Brock. How, so the question is how um, are transplant sort of organ allocation decisions being integrated into, um, or sorry, frailty being integrated into a decision to allocate organs. I would argue that we as a group have always been integrating frailty into our decision making, right? So, um, and but that has always been largely as frailty as um, measured by the eyeball test. So when the patient, you walk into the patient's room in the hospital and their meld is high and they're looking sarcopenic and immobile and they can't raise their arms above their head, um, then they say, then we all as a group will say, you know, this is going to be challenging transplant. I don't, I'm not sure we can make this, get this patient to transplant. In terms of um, have we integrated the liver frailty index into decision, into sort of that, that last minute decision? No. And I'll tell you why we haven't done it yet is that the liver frailty index as currently designed is an outpatient measure. So uh, it has only been developed and validated in the outpatient setting. So what a patient looks like at the moment of the liver offer when the patient is, you know, melda 40 in the ICU on CBVH. Actually, we don't know. Um, how the liver frailty index performs in that setting to prognosticate and to help us with post transplant, you know, assessing post transplant outcomes. Um, but that is an area that is ripe for research. Yes. Uh, so in these instances, your, your nutritional um, recommendations for patients without decompensated cirrhosis, or does frailty only occur in patients with decompensated cirrhosis? Uh, so uh, he was on the microphone, right? So I can uh, just answer that. Um, so it's a really interesting question. I would say that the recommendations, the liver frailty index was only developed in patients with cirrhosis. Okay, so, you know, in terms of, of the derivation and the validation, it only predicts mortality in patients with cirrhosis right now, as we know of. Um, and so, and the recommendations, all the studies that I showed you in data were only tested in patients with cirrhosis. Now, there is a huge body of literature within geriatrics, within HIV, within rheumatoid arthritis, within other disease states that demonstrate that frailty predicts mortality essentially independent of disease. And so I think any patient who has, who, dis, who manifests frailty should get nutritional and exercise intervention and recommendations. But the data that I showed to you today was specific to patients with cirrhosis. Uh, so is a well-compensated patient at risk for becoming frail? Absolutely. And we have definitely seen that in our own cohort, that uh, frailty absolutely progresses in the same way that liver disease severity also progresses. All of these patients with cirrhosis, um, even the child A1s, are highly vulnerable to uh, developing physical frailty um, in an ongoing fashion. Um, and it probably has to do with the underlying pathogenesis of frailty It's um, and cirrhosis. So frailty really is a multi dimensional construct. It comes from uh, chronic inflammation. It comes from uh, hormonal imbalance. Uh, and so, and patients with cirrhosis have that. They're sort of in a chronic inflammatory state. They're, they have, you know, even, even if they're well compensated, still have some baseline hepatic synthetic dysfunction, right? So their muscles are sort of deteriorating at a faster rate. Um, they all, they also, even the child A patients have low testosterone or some sort of hormonal imbalance. Those are uh, definitely contributors to the frail phenotype, so all are vulnerable. So, Jen, um, that's a fantastic talk. How much improvement in the frailty or the index do you think you can achieve hmm. in these patients? Yeah, so how much improvement? I don't know yet. 
because we're just um, we're we just closed a randomized clinical trial of an intervention that we developed uh, of 60 patients, so I haven't really analyzed the results yet, so we'll see. But what I will tell you, just as you hopefully will start to use the liver frailty index in your practice or read it in our notes uh, that we send to you, um, that the the clinically, the minimal clinically significant uh, change in the liver frailty index is about 0.2. So the median value is 3.8, and robust is under 3.2, and frail is above 4.5. So if you change about 0.2 in the liver frailty index, that's sort of the minimal, um, minimal clinically detectable difference, but a change of 0.4 is pretty significant. And I've been using the liver frailty index in my practice for now at least six months, and I would say that I have definitely seen it. I am seeing patients really motivated by these data, really motivated to try to game this index, and they come, they come back and they say, I've been practicing my chair stands, I'm going to do much better on this index, and they will improve by 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, it's really impressive, and I would say, uh, go for it, try to game this index, because if you do, you're going to do much better if you're practicing your chair stands at home. Thank you.